Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much. Monday night. Thanks very much for joining me uh, on my live stream. Comments are coming in. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay, before I start, um, conference, 28th of November. Please get your ticket as soon as you can. I know some of you already have. Thank you very much. It's always it's it's always a great event, our conference. I have to say, it really is. Um, and this year, it's really important, I think, for us all to get together from different parts of the country. I've been around to various parts of the country uh, since we were allowed back out again. But to get us all together is is really important. So please do get your um, your ticket as soon as you can, twenty eighth of November, and. On the matter of traveling around the country, I'm putting dates, put a few dates in the diary today. Uh, November's going to be very busy. A few dates in the diary today for campaigning in various parts of the country. So please keep an eye out for those. Right. Since we last spoke, I, uh, as you know, we had on Friday the murder of an MP, Sir David Amos, uh, in the MP, Conservative MP for South End West. And he was stabbed to death during his constituency surgery in the area, in Leon C on Friday. Um, obviously our hearts go out to his family and friends. Um, and it is, it, it's, it's, it's a tragic and it, 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 it's, it's descent it's a descent. We are, this country is going, you know, nowhere is perfect and this country is not perfect. And it, but this is crazy what we are living in. And what's even more crazy is the reaction and a reaction that may be crazy, but still only to be expected. Headlines in the news tonight are that South End is to be made a city in memory of Sir David Amos. Now, I've no, I, I used to live in South End. Um, I know it quite well. I'm not sure it's big enough to be a city, but whatever. I, it doesn't. It, this is this is insanity, and I make no apology for it. As if making South End a city is is somehow going to to deal with this problem. But even more alarming is talk from Pretty Patel about ending anonymity on the internet. She uh, is turning into a bit of a tyrant actually, but for a bit of context, let me just let me explain who has been detained for the murder of this MP. I'll read this from the BBC. It says, at 13.50 on Friday, Essex police confirmed a 25-year-old man had been arrested immediately at the scene on suspicion of murder and that a knife had been recovered. Whitehall officials have confirmed to the BBC that the suspect who is ha being held at a London police station under the Terrorism Act is Ali Harbi Ali, a British national of Somali heritage. He was born in Southwark in South London and grew up in Croydon, is the son of a former advisor to a previous Somali prime minister and the nephew of the Somali ambassador to China. Now, one thing we won't get presumably, on this is marginalisation, poverty, uh, lack of opportunity. We we'll probably get racism, but, you know, racism is ever-present. Um, this is somebody with connections. This is not... They're not it, it sounds to me like they're probably not at lacking opportunity. Somebody with connections. Uh, in his teenage years, he was referred to the government's extremism program, Prevent, but was never a formal subject of interest for MI5. Uh, 
I it I it has it doesn't say what he's referred to prevent for, but just a quick explanation of prevent. This is a scheme which is intended to grab people. It's a minority report sort of thing. It's sort of grab people before they do anything and to stop radicalization of the person. They've been going after anyone. Uh, it, 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 the, the far right. It's about, but anyway, anyone who doesn't like the current situation in the country with regards to immigration or Islamization will be targeted by this thing as well. Um, but he wasn't of interest to MI5. This you'll notice a lot. This happens a lot. You'll have someone who is a devout Quran following Muslim, which the establishment will call a Muslim extremist, but actually it's just someone who follows the religion to the letter. Um, they will be of that bent, but not deemed far enough along, if you like, to be of interest to the security services. That happens a lot. The security services do, however, watch thousands of declared jihadis, thousands. Um, but there are just too many of them to be watched sufficiently. Too many. There are just too many of these of this ideology in the country and the resources are not available to watch them. So that'll be part of the reason, no doubt, that so many are extreme, but not extreme enough for MI5 or other security services to take an interest in them. Okay, it goes on to say, teachers, members of the public, the NHS and others can refer individuals to a local panel, this is PREVENT, local panel of police, social workers and other experts who decide whether and how to intervene in their lives. Uh, engagement in the scheme is voluntary and is not a criminal sanction. It is thought Mr. Ali did not spend long in the programme. The attack has been declared a terrorist incident by police. The early investigation revealed a potential motivation linked to Islamist extremism, according to the Metropolitan Police's counter-terrorism command. Ali Harbi Ali was initially detained on suspicion of murder, but was further detained under the Terrorism Act late on Friday. On Saturday, detectives were granted a warrant by magistrates to allow them to keep Mr. Ali in custody until Friday, the 22nd of October. He is still being questioned, but has not yet been charged. Let me just tell you when that was an hour ago. Okay. Right. So there's the background. There's the context of all this. In response, we get uh, South End will be made a city. It's nice. It's a nice thing to do. But like I say, here's the alarming part. Now, this comes from an interview with Pretty Patel. She was being interviewed by Trevor Phillips on Sky News on Sunday. I don't know what this murder has to do with social media. That part isn't clear and I cannot find anywhere where it's even alluded to. I mean, people are, this, this is, this I noticed that, you know, this is being made into something social media related. Uh, anything, anything, but look at the real problem. So we've talked a lot about social media and there's features on the press. You know how it is. The BBC will have so-and-so saying, I was abused online and why don't the internet companies do something about it? That sort of, that sort of feature is popping up. And I'm not clear why, because it's not clear what role, if any, social media played in this. So Pretty Patel was on with Trevor Phillips on Sunday and he asked her about whether this is whether this is how Sky News is uh, reporting. 
or sorry, The National uh, is reporting the discussion on Sky News that uh, he'd Trevor Phillips asked her about whether she would consider legislation to remove the right to anonymity on social media. She said, and I quote, this is absolutely extraordinary. I want us to look at everything. There is work taking place already. We have an online harms bill, wait for that, that will come to parliament. There is work, there is work taking place on it right now. I've done a lot of work on social media platforms, mainly around encryption and areas of that nature. But we can't carry on like this. I spend too much time with communities who have been under attack, basically who have had all sorts of postings online, and it is a struggle to get those posts taken down. We want to make some big changes on that. Now, am I the only one bewildered by this? How is restricting freedom on the internet? What's it got to do with this? It again, even in here, it's just it's just not clear. The only possible connection that seems to be being shoehorned in here is that MPs get abuse on social media. And somehow, therefore, Social media is the problem here. Now, I don't particularly like social media, but social media did not murder this man. Guess who did? And no one's talking about that at all. <laughs> nothing, nothing. Um, here's what's going to happen. And this is standard, standard stuff. A tragic event occurs. The reasons for it, the basis for it, the cause of it is completely ignored. And instead, by tenuous link, we will link it. We will we manage somehow to find a way to further restrict people's freedoms in response, even if the two are not even connected. Social media did not murder this man and if abu if MPs take abuse online that's unfortunate but so do a lot of people while Pretty Patel is telling us that she's not going to rule out destroying anonymity online sorry to bang on about this but the borders are still open Thousands of people, we have no idea who they are, are coming into this country on Pretty Patel's watch. Meanwhile, she will take away, or is threatening to take away, the right we have to express ourselves in, for many people, the only way they can which is an anonymous account online. We are so strangled. We are so suffocated. We're living in a sort of a USSR society where people would in, in go out. I, I remember uh, reading particularly about a family where the, the parents would go to the back garden, turn on a radio, turn it up really loud and whisper to each other over this radio in order to speak about current affairs in the country. We're already not there, but we're in a situation where we're afraid to say things to each other unless we say the wrong thing or we say it to the wrong person. You can't say anything to work colleagues. Friendships are ended by saying the wrong thing. Families broken up by saying the wrong thing. That's where we are. So for so many people, an anonymous account online is all they've got to speak freely. It's their only ability to speak freely. And we have to speak freely. We have to. It's a human need to express ourselves. And for millions 
online account, anonymous, is the only way they can do it. Now, granted, there are people online who do behave in ways that are absolutely appalling and they wouldn't do it most likely in real life. And this is the way to sort of let that nasty side of them out. But that's the price of freedom. That's that's what freedom entails. It includes, freedom includes nasty people who are going to say things that are unpleasant and offensive. That's freedom. So now we stand to lose one of the only avenues left that people have to freely express themselves. Our freedoms will disappear as a result of these tragic events, while the real cause of it not only is ignored and brushed under the carpet, but continues to flow in another arena. In other words, while we're facing the threat of not being able to speak on social media, the borders are still open. And people, we have no idea where they're coming from, what views they hold, how violent they might be. They're coming from a culture that is completely alien to us. That's the problem right there. Social media is not the problem. The immigration is the problem. This mass unfettered immigration is the problem. But it will not be addressed. And instead, our ability to object to that very immigration will be hampered further as a result of this tragic event. Speaking of cultures, there was something I wanted to, uh, a video I wanted to show you tonight, and I'm going to show you it just now. Um, but let me just quickly go to a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, what do you make of the public debate following the murder of David Amos? I think I've uh, hopefully covered that. Uh, Jay says the police have the resources to heckle protests that by law they're supposed to aid, not intimidate, provoke and assault the general public. This parliament is a disgrace. I agree with you entirely. Uh, this parliament is a disgrace and the parliament before it was a disgrace and the one before that was a disgrace. And it's been a disgrace for quite some time. We know what to do. We know what we need to do. Clarence, uh, it's got nothing nothing to do with the murder and it's an excuse to clamp down on freedom of civil liberties. Couldn't agree more. Stu, good evening, Stu. Uh, Amory, is it time for the Forbidden Party to invest in the production of rubber dinghies? Moral quibble with that one, um, Stu. Not with rubber dinghies in general, obviously. Nothing wrong with rubber dinghies in general. But when they're being used to invade... I do have a problem with them. Okay, let me go to, um, you'll have heard this story. This is about a the Grand Hotel in Scarborough. And it's another example. And this is a, obviously a less serious matter than the murder of uh, this MP. Um, less serious it is, but so demonstrative of what I'm, talking about what am i talking about this country is a mish mash of people from all over the world who are bringing internal conf when i say internal i mean internal to them internal conflicts into this country bringing completely different sets of values into this country. This is controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway, bringing very different standards of hygiene into the country. And this is coming from a, ver a variety of different sources. We are now a country of endless languages. So we can't even take for granted that we can speak to each other anymore. And, and you know, Tens of thousands of people in Birmingham alone can't speak English. 
it has in my lifetime i've never i haven't known this country be so divided so tense so fractured and it is because we no longer have anything uniting there's nothing uniting the people of this country now this is a free country so people are free to disagree we're not so united that we're going to be uniform and all the same as each other that's a free country people will be different have different belief systems different personal beliefs different ways of living their lives that's freedom but what should unite us language law of the land the law of the land which shapes and helps create a culture a historical identity a heritage all of which are unifiers and all of which are gone from great britain in 2021 if the native british complain about this at all they are dismissed and i'll now show you a video about the it kind of it sums up so much it just sums up so much and i want just before i um before we play the video actually a couple of questions are coming in so let me uh quickly answer them uh If you became an XPM, would you reverse all this tyranny and also prevent by enshrining in law? I'm never attempting this again. Oh, I assume you mean that what they've done to the country. Would you enshrine in law, never doing it again? I think you'd you'd be better. Um, you I have to get too into too detail in this, but a constitution. I think the country needs it won't be easy to do because there are, there are conventions in the legislative process in this country. Um, but we absolutely do need something and a US like constitution that would prevent MPs ever doing this again, that would prevent MPs legislating against the civil liberties of the people in the first place. They take away your civil liberties for a reason. Those liberties are used to keep them in check. If they want to do something with a country, they have to take away your freedom to stop them first. And that's what's happening. That's the phase that we're in at the moment. Uh, Bobby says, MPs should not get special security arrangements to protect them from the consequences of their immigration policies. Face up to the consequences as your constituents have to. You know, that's a great that's a really good comment um and i i can't i i agree i completely and i you know i've said this a hundred times before the mps don't live in the areas that they i mean an mp will not all mps actually <laughs> some mps live in the constituency that they represent many don't but even the ones who do will live in the more upper the upper end of that constituency, the more expensive end, the end where the refugees, quote unquote, are not going to be sent to live. So the MPs, you're absolutely, absolutely right. They don't live with the consequences of this. And if they did, they might think differently about it. A very good comment. As an animal rights activist, how do we stop this halal practice? We, we remove the religious exemption. It's only practice now because there is a religious exemption. Slaughter without stunning is actually illegal in this country, but in a way that makes the law completely unworkable and ridiculous is a exemption, an exemption for the very people who want to slaughter without stunning. So slaughter without slaughtering without stunning is illegal unless you really, really want to slaughter without stunning. That's that's basically what the law does. You remove that exemption and you enforce the law. It's as simple as that. Okay, last question before we have the video. What's your opinion on human rights laws being changed? I want the Human Rights Act tomorrow morning. No question. Get rid of it. It has given activist judges the ability 
to keep terrorists and rapists from all over the world in this country because their safety is threatened. The safety of British people doesn't matter. Their safety may be threatened. I don't care, quite frankly, about the safety of people who threaten the safety of the British people, as anyone in British politics should agree with, but they don't. So everyone, every Tom, Dick and Harry from all over the world is more important than the British people. That's what the Human Rights Act does. That's what it'll do until you scrap it. And the Tories have said several times they'd scrap it. Still there. Still one of the vilest pieces of legislation in the country. Okay, before we finish, I just I've been on TripAdvisor. Just on the on the Scarborough Hotel. I've been on TripAdvisor. And while it's not as much as it was, there are some reviews on here um saying do not so basically confirming what I say in the video about this hotel but it is honestly uh such a little microcosm that's how that's how it feels to me this hotel could well be britain it is britain in a little microcosm okay let's have a look at the video The Grand Hotel in Scarborough has been open since 1867. It's a beautiful and enormous hotel that overlooks the North Yorkshire town's South Bay. It was, in its early days, the largest hotel in Europe, and today it is a Grade II listed building. This means that it is regarded as something of a special building, deemed worthy of preservation. So why am I talking about the Grand Hotel in Scarborough? Well, it's been in the news recently, and as you can probably guess, it wasn't good news. The top two floors of the hotel have been hired in their entirety to house Afghan refugees. There are around 150 Afghans now in residence at the hotel. And let's just say the reviews from other guests have not exactly been glowing. One mustn't complain, however, because that would make you a racist. What else? One review on TripAdvisor was from a woman who told of her experience at the hotel. She said that she waited an hour to check in because the place was so busy. It was mayhem. When she and her partner finally made it to their room, after pushing their way through busy hallways, they were shocked at what greeted them. There was urine on the walls, no quilt on the bed, and Afghan children running in and out of rooms unsupervised. She then decided to go back down to the reception area, having understandably decided against staying there. Now here's what she said. I overheard people talking angrily about the kids and people just stood about. They were refugees and more buses were just parking up. I don't have a problem with this. I just felt we should have been made aware that the hotel would be this hectic. Then we could decide if the noise would be a problem for us. Even though her holiday was entirely ruined, isn't it interesting how she felt the need to say, I don't have a problem with this. Of course she has a problem with this, but she's afraid to make her feelings known lest she be called racist. And everyone knows you can't risk being called a racist. So rather than just tell it like it is, people jump up and down to make sure everyone knows they don't have a problem with this. It's ridiculous when you think about it. It's comical. Anyway, she continued by saying this. I spoke to the man at the desk and asked for a refund and explained why. He then started shouting at me calling me a racist. I am no racist, she continued. I booked the break when the school holidays had ended, so it would be quieter. He flatly refused me a refund, so we left. We went on to pay £150 to get a room for one night, then went home a day early as we were both worn out. 
As I was at the desk getting insulted, at least three others were demanding a refund for the same reasons. So to summarise, a couple go away for a weekend, pay for a hotel, the hotel is a mess, they ask for a refund, they're called racists, they pay £150 for another hotel and go home a day early having had a miserable time. Despite all of this, they still insist they have no problem with the migrants that caused it all. This is not the sole example. Another couple tried to get a refund through their holiday operator because of all the negative reviews they'd read online. They tried to cancel their £338 booking in advance, but to no avail. They too were called racist by the hotel. One of these guests said the following. Our concern is about safety and leaving things in our room because of what we read about theft and kids running wild. Naturally enough, that was racist. Here's what she said in response to that. By no means are we racist. I've worked with refugees and it is not their fault. Not their fault fault. Whose fault is it then exactly? This is such an interesting way to describe it. Not their fault. Of course it's their fault. But how patronising to say that it isn't. What this person is saying is essentially that many Afghans are simply too uncivilised, too different to us, what we find appalling, they find A-OK. -okay. And the irony is, she's right, at least partly. We are dealing here with vastly different cultures. And in Afghans, we're dealing with people who overwhelmingly have zero respect for our culture. If you point out this simple reality, you're a racist. If you complain about this simple reality, you're also a racist. In fact, the only way to avoid being called a racist is to enjoy having urine on your bedroom wall or kids running wild or theft or having your holiday ruined. If you don't enjoy it, you're a racist. Again, it's ridiculous. We're tying ourselves in knots, eating our own tails, chasing ourselves round in circles aiming only to not be called racist. It's our primary concern. Even when our holiday is ruined, that's what matters. To be fair though, it's understandable. Being called racist is the kiss of death. It terrifies people. People have gone to prison for apparently being racist. It's one of the most powerful words in Western discourse. But of course, it no longer has any real meaning. Now, in the West, if you complain about illegal migration, cultural differences, crime, and if the offender is not white, you'll be a racist, the reality of the illegal immigration, the cultural differences, or the crime are apparently irrelevant. If you're white and you complain about someone who isn't, you're a racist. End of story. But let's be fair on all this, though, because there is racism here. There is actual racial hatred, and it is against the British majority. If an Afghan had complained about another Afghan, would they have been called racist? No, they definitely would not. My guess is that even if a black person complained, they would not be called racist either. It's only white people that are given the label, and that is actual racism. You can't make this stuff up. It would drive you mad. But here's something else that would drive you mad. The cost. It too reflects racism. Anti-white racism. As an aside, hatred of whites isn't even considered racist. That's how racist it is. So let's get on to the cost. Apparently the government is paying £250 to the hotel per room per night. Imagine how much that's adding up to. Then we have the refurb. At the end of the Afghan culturally enriching visit to the Grand Hotel, 
the government will foot the bill to have the place entirely refurbished. They know they'll have to. That's telling, isn't it? Here's something else that's rather telling. Homelessness in the town of Scarborough has more than doubled since the coronavirus crisis began. There are hundreds of people in this fairly small town who need accommodation. But guess what? The government isn't housing them in grade two listed hotels. There's no money for that. Plenty of money for Afghans, however. Once again, the British are at the bottom of the heap in Britain. Millions of pounds are being spent housing migrants in the UK at the moment, but the thousands of Brits living on the streets must stay there. 13,000 military veterans are living on the street in Britain. No hotel for them. Meanwhile, record numbers of illegal immigrants continue to arrive. A lot of people are tired of this. I'm one of them. The injustice of it is nearly unbelievable. So here's the reality. British people have been abandoned by the British government. They are only required to pay taxes, to foot the bill. That bill is to pay for all and sundry from all over the world to come to Britain and take, take, take. It's the truth. And everyone knows it's the truth, racist or not. This can't last. At some point, there will be a backlash. To avoid violence, I sincerely hope that backlash is political. Political change is essential now. A great reset is needed, if you like. Both Labour and the Tories must go and their fate is in our hands. If we don't vote for them, they won't be in power. If we do, they will. And this will just continue. Stop voting for this nonsense. Start voting for your own rights, your freedom, your taxes to be spent wisely. Start voting for your children and your country. To put it simply, start voting for Britain. Thank you for watching. If you would like to stay updated with all of our latest videos, please like the video below and subscribe to our channel. As you probably know, For Britain is shadow banned on most social media. So it's really important to like and share our videos in order to get our message out. Thanks again for helping us to fight back. Thanks again for helping us to bring back Britain. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. It just a, a final point before we go. These videos are to promote our party. Please, please share them. That is a standalone video on YouTube at the moment. So please share it. Um, and finally, last reminder for tonight. Well, for tonight, I'll be reminding you every, every chance I get between now and the 28th of November. The conference 28th of November. Please get your tickets as soon as you can. It is going to be a great event. It always is. I love our conferences uh, and I'm sure that the members who have been to our previous ones will confirm that they are great, um, a great day out. So 28th of November, please get your ticket as soon as you can. Okay, everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, look after yourselves. Um, when am I back? Back on Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock with all things Hartlepool. Um, and I do have some dates in the diary for various different parts of the country to get out campaigning. So have a look out for them. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care of yourselves and I shall see you all very soon. Thanks again.